welcome to today's talk at the library. Um, we will talk about Asia in Africa. My name is Rebecca Farner. I'm um, Outreach and Communications Manager at Asia Society Switzerland. And it's my great pleasure to introduce you today to Patrick Siltener. Um, professor Siltener is Associated Professor at the University of Zurich and Lecturer and University Counselor at the University of St. Gallen. He has analyzed multi and bilateral free trade agreements for more than 15 years, and he's co-editor of the recently published book, African-Asian Relations, Past, Present, Present and Future. And the World Society Foundation and Patrick Siltner were kind enough to give us a few copies. One is for our library, but we have a few more. So if you're interested in taking one home, um, please check with us afterwards. And for the ones who can't get a copy or are joining us online, um, there is a link on the World Society Foundation's um, website with the PDF to download, I will send that link in the thank you email as well. Um, yes, and also if you're joining online, exactly, you can submit questions via the Q&A function. Um, please don't use the chat. I will only check the Q&A function on my phone. Um, if you're having questions here in the room, um, Serena over there, I uh, will hand you a microphone so that people online can hear you as well. Um, yeah, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, usually, Asian Society Switzerland aims to cover an uh, entire continent in this program, the one in our name, Asia. And as if this weren't uh, difficult enough to achieve, today we are adding a second continent, Africa. Um, we will, of course, not be able to cover every country, every relation, and every region in one hour, but we will talk a little bit about China. We will also talk about a few other countries, yeah. and we try to at least, um, at least try to fit it in somehow at, in the global Thank you for today and on this difficult challenge. Um, I did create a few maps, uh, which Manuela will share for everyone right now. So in case somebody forgot where the two continents are, we do see in yellow Africa, which was easy to color in, a bit harder was Asia because there is not that one definition of Asia. I just colored in pink everything, which is sometimes referred um, to the Asian region. Um, <laughs> here is the world map with all the countries. And because I assume that most of us uh, know a little bit about Asia, but not as much about Africa or also have a close up from Africa. So just uh, in case uh, it is for you as for me that you forgot where all those countries are. Um, Professor Siltener, which parts do you cover in your book? Um, how do you define Asia? And just to add one more question, why did you decide to uh, write or edit a book um, about Asian African relations and not, for example, just about relations. Right. <clears throat> so, first, let me say thank you for the invitation. I'm very glad to present my book here. I have edited uh, this book on behalf of the World Society Foundation. World Society Foundation has been founded by sociology professor Peter Heinz in 1982. Um, so that means 40 years of sponsoring globally oriented research and uh, especially uh, supporting the research by researchers from the global south. I think that's quite remarkable, this uh, foundation, because it has sponsored globally oriented research uh, at the time and nobody was talking about globalization yet. So this has quite a research tradition. So this global oriented approach um, is clearly in this research tradition 
of the World Society Foundation. It's also remarkable, I think, because we try to have a long-term historical perspective with this. So this is not just about recent dynamics in this, between these countries, but we need to get over a Eurocentric perspective. And unfortunately, we still think like that many times. It was the Europeans who combined the world. We integrated the world economy in the age of the European colonial empires. And the region we talk about, or the, the inter-region connection we talk about today, that's especially fascinating. And you will see this in chapter one in the historical part, that this has been an economically and also culturally uh, interactive region, a kind of integrated regions for thousands of years. So long before the first European ship entered the Indian Ocean, um, Chinese were in East Africa, Africa Africans were in uh, India or Southeast Asia. And we need a new understanding of this historical background because we just, we don't have this on our radar. So we think the world came into existence through, through the Europeans, but this is not true. These societies have been larger. Some of them have been technologically more advanced and they have been in interaction for, for thousands of years. So I think this is really the starting point. And then we see the new dynamism today as a kind of coming back of dynamic uh, interregional relations and not as something that has only recently started. So can you say like um, African Asian relations take up uh, for centuries or for thousands of years, but the Sino African relations are rather a modern, um, a modern assumption. They have been um, relations or direct relations, let's say that. They have been indirect relations for centuries via Persia and Arabia. And there have been, especially there has been one uh, exception, I think in the 16th century, with a direct contact from China um, to Africa. But the direct... Uh, relations between countries in Africa and China are a rather new uh, phenomenon. Can you give us a little bit of an overview uh, or a few examples which countries are the most important to China, um, what relations they have, um, how they are sometimes similar, but also how they differ from each other? So the first historical part of your question, um, of course, we have very good evidence for, for early 15th century, so for the 1405 to 1430, when the new Ming dynasty established relations all over the region. And the background of this, of course, is what we call the Sinocentric tribute trade system. So this was a kind of international relations centered on China. And there were massive expeditions, naval expeditions by the early Ming dynasty that reached the, the eastern coast of Africa. This is well documented. We also have uh, archaeological findings in eastern Africa. And again, this is 50, 60 years before the first European ship entered the Indian Ocean. So this is very clearly, but this is only the tip of the iceberg because they have been at the lower level, uh, not, not uh, government-led naval expeditions, but just traders. You know, trading is something something very, very old. And if you understand the geography of the Indian Ocean, then you know this is very suitable for trading. You have the monsoon winds. You can follow the coasts. So even with smaller ships, you can uh, establish exchanges. And we also linguistic research shows. For example, we have some Malay words in Madagascar, which clearly proves that there has been historical connection between these regions. And that's why we were so glad to uh, invite Professor Bojar, a French uh, historian, which has focused on the long-term history of the Indian Ocean to prove all of this. Now, talking about today, um, China's focus is the world, very clearly. So the, the so-called New Silk Road or the Belt and Road Initiative, or as it's called now, the Global Development Initiative is a global perspective. So the, the level that China is... Um, uh, addressing the world is very clearly a global level. So China deals with every country individually, 
But we also have clear evidence for China does not care about the political system or the, the, the political regime of these countries. China works with every regime, be it democratic, authoritarian, one-party systems. China develops its initiatives with all of them. Would you say they look all a little bit the same or is it depending on the country how they develop relations and in what form? Is it trade? Is it investments? Is it aid? There is some aid, but aid is not the main focus of uh, China. And they are quite self-confident about their, their Belt and Road strategy. They say what we do is better and we achieve better results than 40, 50, 60 years of Western development aid. So development is, is rather uh, small, the amounts. But the approach of China is very well known. They define so-called win-win situations. Is this profitable for both sides? This is not development aid. What is also maybe not well known is that um, these are Chinese um, government banks, state banks, that finance a lot of these infrastructure projects in Africa. But this money does never go to Africa, but it remains in China to have also to avoid uh, corruption losses and go directly to the to the Chinese company, which then sets up these infrastructure projects um, in Africa. Now, talking about these uh, deals, usually we are asked, um, are they good deals for African countries or not? And of course, there are many different deals and we also document a variety of deals. <laughs> And, they, and there's not one standard format of deal that China is doing, but they do different kinds of. So this is a, a, a result of a negotiation between the, the national governments or regional governments and China. And what we also have found is that the, the result, if it's a good deal for Africa or not, deals a lot about the competence on the African side in these negotiations. So they are kind of bad deals, which are not professional in the scale, um, and they are very good deals. So important is if when we reconstruct this story, this is not China um, penetrating Africa, but this is a bilateral, these are bilateral deals. So it depends on very much also on African agency. So we have to take into account African agency into this. Uh, stories and that was one of the <laughs> i think best points in the book that our young researchers mostly young researchers that document their research in africa that they combine these aspects so they also focus on african agency and currently i think a lot of these relationships are bilateral as you said but there are also so um, multilateral mm -hmm. um cooperation with the African Union, which includes 55 countries um, from Africa and also projects such as infrastructure projects, for example, like linking Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda and South Sudan. Um, do you think those approaches, those multinational um, approaches will become more important? Yeah, we have um, several chapters on that. And the interesting thing is that China really supports African integration and really proactively. So we document some initiatives where really China started these initiatives and kind of not pushed, but invited African countries to um, work together, to collaborate in certain regards. Maybe the most famous aspect is that China built the African Union's headquarters in Ethiopia. It was completely, it's completely China built. And also the consultation mechanisms, China prefers to work at multilateral uh, level. That's interesting. So both bilateral level, especially for infrastructure projects, but in some regards also at multilateral. And quite interestingly, for example, China pushed for uh, African-wide free trade uh, agreement. You did say so that China is trying to like have the interest of African countries in mind as well. Um, we talked about it last week that uh, I'm sure you all know um, the case of uh, 2017 in Sri Lanka 
um, so she went to Sri Lanka, released the harbor in Tabantota to China for the next 99 years to pay back some of its debt. Um, probably the most prominent example of the debt trap narrative, the so-called. And we do hear it often that um, China is pursuing such a strategy in Africa as well. Um, would you agree with that? How do, how do you see China's behavior as a creditor in Africa? The so-called uh, debt trap argument means that China is intentionally driving countries into debt with these projects in order to take over later if they cannot pay the debt, the interests um, that the Chinese take that over. And the research, not, not especially in our book, but research especially by Deborah Beutigam and other researchers in the US show quite clearly this is not the case. So China wants this project to work according to the agreement, which is, which is, uh, it is based on. And of course, this is that. So these interests have to be paid. China has also proved to be quite flexible in renegotiation, uh, renegotiating these uh, kind of uh, debts. So they do not want that. And Hanban Tota, the case they mentioned, this harbor in Sri Lanka, was a kind also uh, regarding public uh, diplomacy, a kind of uh, Catastrophe for China because it was really bad image, but um, we have no evidence and there have been hundreds of projects have been analyzed and compared in this regard. We have no evidence that there's a systematic debt trap strategy by China in Africa or uh, elsewhere. So the results in this regard are quite clear. What we also found is that China does not have yet much experience in this in this kind of debt management. So many of these cases have to do with uh, bad management. And the good news is that China is working hard to improve this kind of debt management. Okay, maybe going a bit away from China for a moment, we can go back afterwards. I'm sure we will. Um, but. I do also want to have a look at India, which is a bit in the spotlight uh, of global media as well currently. They do have a long history with uh, Africa as well, which is probably also because it's um, very close. Um, some bad chapter as well as uh, in Uganda in 1972, I think all um, Indians have been expelled. Uh, but currently... India is um, investing largely in the health sector in Africa. Uh, this includes funds for affordable medicine, um, collaboration on research, scholarships for African students. Um, and India is as well running hospitals and other facilities in several countries, including Uganda and Nigeria, Ghana, Rwanda, Mozambique, and some others. Um, what potential do you see in Africa's health sector, like in the relationship with India, but also does India have um, by investing in that? Yes, it was very important uh, when we developed the conception for the for this research and this book that we do not focus on uh, China alone. Of course, China is the big actor in Africa now, and most of the projects we described are uh, China-led projects, but. Other countries have uh, developed relations too. We had uh, we had especially a look at uh, at Japan. We have a chapter on uh, South Korean initiatives and, as you mentioned, the the Indian initiatives. So there's also a comparative analysis of uh, Chinese initiatives and Indian initiatives in Africa. India has also a kind of uh, um, um, framework, a kind of regional framework, a India Africa meeting framework. But of course, the, the level, the scale of the initiative is not comparable with uh, uh, the ones with China. But the interesting thing is that India focuses on one of its core competence, which is the health sector and especially the pharmaceutical industry and the, also the training of uh, people in the health sector. And uh, is they're quite um, successful. And is it with... Um... Is the interest in aiding Africa or is there also like counter um, balance? I mean, is this a win-win situation as well as China is pursuing its relationship? I would say so. What we describe, I would say so. 
Um, the difference is, of course, the scale, and this is by far not that massive. And there's, of course, nothing comparable to the Belt and Road Initiative from uh, other actors. There have been some concepts, but, um, and also we have to say competition is really tough. You know, I mean, competition is really tough, and uh, the Chinese are quite proactive, or you can even call it uh, quite aggressive. Now, why are the Chinese so successful in Africa? This is also a question I've been asked many times, and we have some evidence together. Of course, first, this is about costs. We have evidence that a Chinese infrastructure project costs 40 to 50% less than when it's constructed by a Western, a European, or American company. So that's, of course, hard to beat. Sometimes it's argued that it's uh, of lower quality, these infrastructure projects. We have some evidence for that, but especially in poor developing countries, sometimes a cheaper and less quality infrastructure project is, makes sense for these countries. I mean, they prefer that. So it's about cost, but it's not only this, it's also about speed. The Chinese build these things in a very, very impressive speed. It has to do with the organization methods. It has to do that they just started, so they do not uh, care about, you know, for example, um, impact research, what would be the archaeological or social impact of these projects, they just start to do it, yes, what do you want, let's get the terms ready, and then they will start this. And now we have an interesting uh, effect that, especially in democracies in Africa, the problem with democracies, we live in a democracy, is they are rather short term, because you have to get re-elected in four years. So if you can finish a project in two or three years within the same electoral cycle, then you have a great advantage. So that's why the Chinese are very popular, because you will get re-elected if you can open the airport within four, four years. And that's one of the strengths um, of the Chinese companies. And maybe the third aspect, they have a long-term orientation when they come, for example, in the telecom sector in Africa. And... They work for smaller profits. One, um, one American colleague told me once, you know, in the telecom sector in Africa, the, the profits, the returns on investment are so low that, uh, that somebody like uh, Apple would never get into this market. So the long-term orientation and to work for smaller profits also is one of the reasons of the success of Chinese companies in Africa. Just Europe's history with Africa play a role in that. I mean, we I don't want to go into it, but we all know um, there uh, has been massive colonization of Africa and Asia has experienced that as well. It's kind of, it's a shared history um, and maybe some mistrust towards Europe um, from Africa. Does this, this play in China's and Asia's hand that um, they do have that shared history and a bit more trust? Yeah, it was kind of shocking uh, for me when I remember the beginning of this century in the early 2000s when the first uh, articles uh, were published about the Chinese initiatives in Africa that sometimes the background feeling was like um, they are in our backyard. You know? So this is a very old-fashioned way of thinking to see Africa as European backyard. And um, that was quite... I think helpful to understand that this time is really over. You know, this time is over. Nobody has a backyard anymore, either in Latin America or in Africa. And this is all legitimate uh, behavior of these actors, you know. And I also have the opinion that we have a kind of healthy competition. It's good for these countries that uh, there's competition in this regard with these um, initiatives. Now, talking about Colonialism. For example, there was an economist a title page on China, the new colonialists. And you see a rather massive a Chinese per, a person sitting on a camel in the, somewhere in the, in, the, in the Sahara. And we have done research also on colonialism and the long-term impact of colonialism in, the, in this world. And we have to say very clearly, we talk about colonialism if there is an aspect of violence involved. So if there's a loss of sovereignty uh, involved, and this is not the case. China does not accept or uh, um, expect um, a reduction of sovereignty. So they respect, and also we have evidence that in most cases also 
China does not interfere into the domestic political affairs of these countries. Are we looking a little bit, it's called past, present, and future into the future. I recently read an article from Yoichi Min, um, who said that by the end of the century, each continent, so Africa and Asia, will um, account for about 40% of the world's population. Together, that makes 80% of the world's population. I can do math. Um, <laughs> are we in Europe underestimating the importance of Africa? And can we maybe learn from China and Asia in shifting our focus maybe also not just towards Asia, but we are doing um, every day here at uh, Asia Society, but also more towards Africa. Yes, I think that's uh, correct. And as I have mentioned, we are interested especially in, in long-term trends, so it's not just the, the most recent initiatives. And um, most researchers come to the conclusion that we are, it's a kind of going back to a situation before the European expansion. So we will get used to that, as you said, the demographic uh, centers, but also the economic center will not be in Europe anymore. This is not um, a, such a, a bad story for Europe. So I, I don't think this is about the decline. It's um, the relativity of importance is shifting, of course, the center of gravity is shifting, but this does not mean a decline that Europe is going to be a kind of new periphery again, as it used to be several hundred years ago before the fantastic and spectacular rise of Europe to the center of the world economy. So we are going back to a historical situation uh, which has been normal. And I think the consciousness about that is, is there in Asia, especially. So they see this, that we are going, so they see the last 200 years as an aberration. So the last 200 years was the exception, and this is going back to the center of this uh, African-Asian world again. And they're very self-confident. So, for example, I hear Chinese voices. They say, okay, in 20 years, um, Western supremacy will be over. How are we going to develop the new world order? They say that openly like that. And the good news for us is, I think, that they do not want to change basically the world order because they were successful in the Western-led world order. Many of the rules, regulations, institutions of this world order are accepted by the large majority of uh, Asian countries, but they will change some things, of course. That's a very interesting research area. So what are they going to change? And also here, Chinese voices, for example, are very clear. Um, let's talk about human rights. They basically think that the idea, the concept is a good thing, human rights, but they say it's too much based on Western values. So we're going then to change that more into the direction of Asian values. What does it mean? Western concept of human rights, we talk about uh, individual political rights, participation, and also uh, protection against uh, a government uh, incursion or government uh, uh, measures. So individual political rights. And in China, they say this is this is based on Western values. We think um, security, safety, economic development is more important than individual political rights. But what we are going to, that's my, that's what I see in the future. There will be no radical change of the global order with this increasing weight of uh, African and Asian countries, but we will see shifts in the content of certain institutions and certain concepts. This will be not a revolutionary process. This will be incremental step by step, as I mentioned in the case of how, how human rights are defined. And for the Western countries, the US and Europe, we have to get used. This process has started already. So we see this process. This is taking place right now. And we have to get used to a world which is more defined by Asian and African countries than Western countries. <laughs> 